Want to add a little spice to life? Why not grow your own herbs? It's easy to do, and fresh herbs are not only delicious in foods, their health benefits are legendary. Herbal treatments, straight ahead on this edition of Great Gardening. Once the plant is infected, there really isn't anything you can do about it. The, the root flare is right along here, so we want to make sure that's below ground level. Watermelons, musk melons. This is a yellow or gray cone flower. This one's called uh, Picasso in pink. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. We're going to add some flavor to the program with fresh grown herbs. And our zesty garden experts are back. We have Tom Casper, the president of the Duluth Garden Flower Society, and Bob Olin, horticulturist and state and county educator with us. Well, you guys always add spice to the program, <laughs> but tonight especially, I hope you're ready to do that because we're going to talk about all the great herbs you can grow to add spice to your life to your this, cooking. I've been called a lot of things, but I don't know if I've ever been called zesty. You've never been called zesty? <laughs> never zesty. Well, you're welcome then <laughs> Thank for you. that first time. <laughs> okay, our phone volunteers are here as well, and we thank them for taking time away from garden duties to answer your questions. They're from the Duluth Garden Flower Society Gitchy Gumi Club. Call them at 218-788-2844 or toll free if you need to at 1-877-307-8762. You can also email your questions during this program to askgardening at wdse.org. We hope to get some emailed questions. Uh, we had a little, a little technical glitch with that in the past, but uh, feel free to email if you prefer to do that. Well, hey guys, there are green things growing finally. in the garden right now, finally. <laughs> Spring <laughs> looks like it might have arrived. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's going to happen. We've got rain in the forecast now. Soil temperatures are moving up. It's going to happen very, very quickly. So mm -hmm. uh, don't be fooled. This, this season is going to take off very soon. Yeah. Right. And obviously things are ready to go in. Bob, you brought us a whole tray of herbs since we're talking about herbs tonight. And so uh, we're, we're pleased to see that uh, we're ready and finally the weather is going to be ready. <laughs> That's right, and I, I think it's going to be a great year. You mentioned herbs. Uh, so many people now are taking a look at what mm -hmm. they're eating, how they're eating, and uh, these are the type of things you can grow yourself quite easily right. and incorporate into your diet with all the benefits that come along with it. Absolutely. Well, for this week's tip, we met with Sandy Heward to talk more about growing and using herbs. What I'm trying to, to display here is as uh, the idea of having them close at hand and having them portable. Um, this particular, these strawberry pots look, work really nice for a little herb garden. You can use them anywhere. Um, another idea, if you have a hook on your deck, you could make a little pot like this. I myself, on the railings of my deck, have something similar to this and line them up with herbs. It's um, wonderful to be able to walk out your back door in your jammies if you want and just clip them you know like on the basil take i take the biggest leaves or, or clip it off of the top to bush them out and you know as they start sprawling just cut them back and they'll just keep filling in they like full sun they like they like the heat and and so a nice sunny 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 spot is is where you're going you're to put, put them and closer to your house you'll get more heat and to me when they're closer to your house you take you use them more and you take better care of them um, one thing with herbs is you do want to keep using them. You don't want them to go to seed. Keep them clipped. Keep, keep the blossoms gone. If you have too much, you could dry some. Or if you're doing um, some pestos, there's all kinds of uh, basils that you can use for, pe for pesto. You can freeze it. Um, I've done some ice cube trays when I want just a little bit or I'll do a cup at a time. And it's wonderful to take out in the winter to have something fresh. And the other thing that you don't want to do is overwater them. Most herbs do not like standing in water, like your rosemaries and thymes. They, they just, um, they'll start dampening off and, and dying. You're going to want to probably do some fertilizing when they're in a small pot like this because they're just, they're going to be feeding and feeding and feeding. Basil, I think, is one of the most popular herbs as are the thymes and 
Um, cilantro for your salsa is wonderful. Rosemary grape for um, pork and lamb and um, I've seen, if you can grow them big enough, I've seen examples where they'll use stems of rosemary, they'll peel off the, the leaves and use them as skewers to add flavor on, on the grill. When you're making a BLT, we do not use lettuce. We will use our big basil leaves and it really adds a really nice, nice, nice element to it. Chive blossoms are really pretty on a, on a potato salad. These days I think people are really health conscious and Herb, fresh herbs just have so much more flavor, but um, for people like on a low sodium diet, adding herbs um, adds so much flavor, you don't need the salt. Well, absolutely. Um, herbs can go into a lot of different foods in a lot of different ways. Uh, Sandy from Lake Superior Garden Center, we want to thank them for, for providing this and for providing her time and expertise and, and just, just talk a little bit more about some of the things that you can grow in a pot like this. It's, you know, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different herbs in one little pot that you can put on your patio or on your deck and, and have spice in your meals all summer. <laughs> yeah, spice right. in your That's life. Right. You know, it really is your kitchen garden. Yeah. And uh, you're talking a little bit about health benefits. The greatest thing, and Sandy mentioned this, is the fact you can substitute for salt. Mm -hmm. And so many of these herbs have kind of subtle flavors, and we're kind of reintroducing our taste buds right. to what real food should taste like. Well, on the other end of that, you can also substitute for sugar. The stevia plant uh -huh, um, is sure. a, a sugar substitute, mm -hmm. and it's considered a spice. It's kind of cool. We had a bunch of uh, Piedmont kindergartners up, and they all tasted a leaf of the stevia plant and commented on how sweet it was. So. Mm, sure, I bet kids love that. Yeah. Well, also some ideas for some uh, things that you can put herbs in. Herbed butter is something you can do, and Sandy talked about that. Um, we have more information about that on our website, but basically it's just a half cup of softened butter and then any herb you want to use. You could use, do an herb vinegar, and one of the things um, that was suggested to us was dill in vinegar, and uh, you just put it in a bottle, um, and it will keep for a good long time, and then you've got it for your potato salads and such. Again, we've got some more specifics about that on our website. And then um, a lot of things really grow well up here in northern climates. Sure. You take a look at this list, and uh, all these things can really be used with, uh, with meats. You, you mentioned the, uh, the butter and so forth, but certainly for fish, for anyone that got fish mm -hmm. on that okra, managed to get through that, uh, <laughs> that hard water out there. One spice for each fish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But again, each has its own unique flavor. And the great thing about growing your own or purchasing materials mm -hmm. that are fresh, uh, you've got these, the real aroma and the fragrances mm -hmm. uh, really can't compare with dried material. This is so much better. It is. And, um, and it'll keep coming back. Now, Bob, these are some of the ones that you've got started. And, um, and y you clip the tops. I think Sandy mentioned that. And uh, it'll just keep coming back. Yeah. It'll keep producing. Some are annuals, mm -hmm. and, and uh, basil obviously is. But mm -hmm. the others are perennials. The chives, mm -hmm. as an example, the thyme. Mm -hmm. The little protection can be, uh, certainly can be perennial. Sure. Rosemary, they're all perennials, some of them a little bit uh, winter sensitive, but right. you can mulch them in and you can get them through the winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the th and the thing you want to really keep in mind if, if you are using these for cooking is is probably do it in a little bit more moderation because sure. as you mentioned, they're, they're very, very fragrant, very uh, much better tasting than the dried stuff. So if you're, if you're using it in a recipe and you're going to fresh, maybe do it in a little bit more moderation to start with because yeah. it is a little stronger, which is great. Tom, I'll tell the story. We had one individual that had to get rid of salt from the diet because of her husband's uh, health condition, and she said, you know, the amazing thing, we rediscovered food, and my husband's health has improved, but radically or surprisingly, the whole family's health. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. that's wonderful. It's contagious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's get to some questions from some of our viewers. Ellen from Lake Nebagaman. She has round patches of dead brown grass in her yard that are spreading and they're increasing. Now, she was told that they're either cinch bugs or a fungus, but wonders what to treat them with. And also, then once she treats, does she need to reseed those? Um, also, the neighbors, their neighbors are getting the same situation there. <laughs> we kind of like this. It's either a fungus or it's an insect. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Which is it? What is you it? You know, it could be both or either. Okay. Uh, what you want to do with chinch bug, now they're going to be very active uh, as temperatures warm, but you can actually find the insect. And that's, this is a situation before you do any treating at all. You really want to come in and you can just cut both ends out of a tin can, force it right in that margin area where the, there's green grass and there's dead grass, and add a little water, 
try to float them out or just dig in the soil surface. If you find chinch bugs, uh, they're easily controlled with mm -hmm. over-the-counter insecticides. You don't need. What do they look like, Bob? Uh, you know, they have a very they're a beetle. They have a very distinctive yellow cream band across okay. the back, and they're only about a sixteenth of an inch. And if you're digging in the soil right now, they will be rather active. All right. But find the insect first. If you don't have any evidence at all, then it could be a fungal issue, a fungal, fungus problem. We treat them both uh, differently. And the reseeding then? Once you've eliminated the problem, yes, then we will want to reseed. If it's a fungal issue, it may be drainage, so there mm -hmm. may be more that we have to do. But uh, we want to eliminate the, either the environmental condition that caused the fungi, the moisture accumulation, or we want to eliminate the insect. Once the problem is taken care of, at that point, add a little more topsoil and definitely reseed. Okay. And that can be done any time now. All right. Well, Sue from Carleton wants to know the best time to divide her perennial geraniums. Right now. Okay. Really, spring as they're coming up is the perfect time to All do right. it. So. Do they have to be a certain size to do that? No, you can take that clump and break it into multi multiple uh, individual mm -hmm. plants very easily. And geranium is very easily divided. So. All right, great. How do I keep weeds from uh, between my raspberry canes? Oh, there's a good issue. <laughs> <laughs> First off, anyone that's going to be establishing a new raspberry plat patch, eliminate all of the perennial weeds, quackgrass in particular. Once it's established in the rows, then you, heavy mulch will work, black plastic will work, uh, newspaper, heavy cardboard, anything like that. I would advise against using herbicides for fear that you'll have some drift that will affect the, uh, the canes themselves. But a good heavy organic or plastic mulch will do the job for you. Black plastic must be. Okay, Marion from Duluth wants to know, can you still transplant rhubarb? Is it too late for that? No, that's the great thing about the season being a little slow getting yeah. started. <laughs> uh, go right ahead and, and transplant them. I think you'll be successful until you get uh, maybe sh sprouts that are three, four inches in height. What's a good way to get rid of horseradish? I don't want to use Roundup. That's from Patty in Duluth. Well, there's a challenge. There's something that they <laughs> planted as, as an herb yeah. or something, and it kind of got away yeah. from them. Uh, it, it'll be reseeding, and so what she's going to have to do if she doesn't want to use any kinds of chemicals is she's just going to have to be very, very vigilant about anything that seeds and rake it out of there. Pull it. Okay. Good okay. cleanup. All right. Um, Naomi in Duluth has a fairy garden in her bird bath with hens and chicks in it. I think she means the plant, not the birds. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she wa she's wondering if it'll survive the winter if it's covered. Well. It it won't survive if it's a raised garden. So if she has okay. a fairy garden, say, in a container like this, it, it won't survive like that. If she buries that container ground level, it will, or placing it in a, in a cool place that doesn't get too cold. Okay. But it will survive um, if, she, if she does protection for it. So. All right. Mary Lou in Duluth says, I planted garlic last fall and it hasn't come up yet. Is it possible that it still will? Um, an addendum to that, we got this question last week, so maybe she's seen the garlic coming up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Within the last week. Garlic didn't have the best winter. Unlike uh -huh. the rest no. of us, has really enjoyed all that winter weather. But uh, <laughs> garlic, the problem we had there is if we didn't have a good mulch layer, and a lot of these are a little tender, and we had cold weather in December with a lot of snow. So give it a little bit more time. If it was planted a little deep, it could still be emerging. Uh, but I think you should be able to get 50% uh, or more survival rate, even in a difficult year like this. And I okay. really think we're going to see a lot of that because of that lack of snow cover and cold that we saw in November and December before the snows finally came. Mm. So we're probably going to see some damage in, in even some of our established perennial gardens. So. Okay. I think we have time for uh, maybe one or two more. What's the best way to grow dill from seed? How deep do I grow it? Um, covered plant and when does it germinate? That's from Linda in Hermantown. Okay, a lot of questions about dill. Uh -huh. the, the answer is very easy, just direct seed about a quarter of an inch. And uh, some of the problem can be, again, it can go to seed and it can sure. reseed for you. So very and easy. A, it could go a perennial? In. Uh, it, it really will reseed for you. It's okay. really not going to be perennial in, in this area, but the, you get reseeding and you get some dormant seeding that occurs in the fall of the year. But Easy to germinate. I would probably uh, maybe give it another week or so, and then go ahead. It'll be it'll do very well for you. Okay. And, and like Bob said, if you really if it goes to seed, it can take over your garden. Oh, so you sure. really want to be careful. And with dill it. really just scatters. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's so feathery on top. Or yeah. but maybe that's the wrong term. But <laughs> it's great again as a um, you know, of course, dill pickles. But of course, certainly yes. for potatoes and other things. Oh, it's, lots it's of things. Wonderful, yeah, wonderful it is a wonderful herb to have. Okay, well, we'll have more questions coming up, 
but right now we want to talk about this week's tour which takes us to a Duluth home with an amazing array of blooms grown in the charming greenhouses right on site. Hi, I'm Mary Jane. Thank you for coming to see my gardens. We're on the West Tisha Road, just above Woodland. Um, I've been out here for 41 years, so I've had a lot of time to get gardens established. And then we've got a lot of flocks on this side. This whole side of the yard used to be just like gravel. So we put down cement so it's easier to keep the gardens contained and we can clean easier. We've had a lot of roses because I like roses. This is a rose tree that I have had for about three years now and this is one of the things I like to grow. We finally figured out how to keep them alive over the winter, so I've got about five or six of those through the yard, and um, I really like them because they're, they give height. We've got a little playhouse in the back here that we just fixed that up because it was the center of our yard. We have a little small addition on our house, and so when he was digging the, the underground um, for the foundation of it, he saved all the rocks and made this stream up here. There's one at the top, and then there's a real kind of babbling brook coming down, and then at the bottom there's another small fall. I always said I want a waterfall. I want to be able to put my feet in, and I've always had dahlias. Got the little round yellow ones, and in the bottom of my yard there I have a lot of the purple that I've had for since I moved here 40 years ago, 41 years. And those were from my grandmother. We call this the Ivy House. My daughters helped me build this. And after the second year, they started growing in through the, through this, over the top. And they started growing along the ceiling and I thought they were pretty. Um, they come up early in the spring and before anything is blooming outside, there's green leaves in here, so it's really nice to work in here to get plants established. Um, we take a lot of plants out of our basement and bring them in this one and heat this one first. And it's just so nice to work in here when you have the greenery above you. And so I have a little table set up in here that we like to make little lunches or dinners. This is the third year we've had these greenhouses. I grew a lot of tomatoes and petunias and um, different herbs and we've had them just filled. So it's been really nice to be able to plant the yard and just go into the greenhouse and get what you need. Yeah, I started all the annuals. Um, most of the things you see in the, in the yard are from the things that I've, that I've started from seed. There's a high bush cranberry in the back of our yard here that I think is kind of pretty. So I put a little sitting area there so we could have a little tea. Yeah, this has really been fun. It's the first year that I've been able to take care of so much gardening. And um, it's kind of nice to be able to do what you like. And if anybody ever wanted to stop by and see our gardens, we're always happy to show any of our gardening friends what we're doing. Gorgeous place. Yeah, they were on our garden tour last year mm -hmm. for the Duluth Garden Flower Society. Outstanding gardens and just great hosts. So. Yeah, yeah, they're really fun. Okay, some more questions. Um, we have some vines on the front of our house. The leaves last summer turned white and wilted. I sprayed water and uh, little white flies appeared. That's from Shelly in Duluth. What do you mm. think is going on there? We're well, probably guessing leaf hoppers. Maybe. I think that the the white might be powdery mildew, and, and the problem with pouring water on it only encourages some of this. So. Um, you don't pour water on a drowning plant or a drowning man. And, and then the, the, the flies themselves could be secondary. They could be leaf hoppers. They yeah. could be uh, they could be white fly, okay. which is native to the area, but probably not. Uh, haven't probably impacted the plant. It probably was the fungus that did it. And there are things to treat those that you can find at your garden center. Or yeah, there's right, always something man, with with maybe. the uh, with the <laughs> fungi. It's more of a function of the the type of season we had. All okay. fungicides really have to go on prior to seeing these spores or the symptoms. 
Yeah, and hopefully if it was powdery mildew, that won't be a problem this year. So. All right. Um, here's another white powdery question. I have a white powdery deposit on the stem of my one and a half foot tall white pine. That's from Catherine in Saginaw. Okay, she's got a foot and a half, so she really has a, a young seedling. Uh, once again, it's a fungi. It's probably not the white pine blister rust that people really get concerned about. Nonetheless, there isn't a lot that she can do about it. It's just going to have to grow its way out of it. Okay. Uh, Roger from north of Duluth has an, an interesting question. He has a compost pile. It's shaded, and there's a plant there that grows in it that's four inches tall with a white stalk and red top and really stinks. <laughs> Stinkweed. Oh, really? Aptly <laughs> named. <the> name. <laughs> <laughs> so and when you brush up against it or touch it, it is very pungent. Really? Yep. So, um, Easy to pull. It's just pull it out yep. and uh, wear gloves? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's what it is, Roger. All right. Teresa in Finland says, what causes the little white moth on my cabbage? Well, that one's pretty easy and, and characteristic of all the cabbage family. Um, these are the adult moth of the imported cabbage worm or the cabbage looper. And uh, they actually don't do any damage except they lay a lot of eggs, which of course hatch and give you the larvae or the worm form, and they do do the damage. Here we've got a good organic control that actually works and it's very effective. Uh, one of the product names is Dipel or BT Dipel, Bacillus okay. thuringiensis. When she sees the butterflies or the moths, has to go on about two days after you first see them and repeat it weekly. Okay, and then Mary from, from Cloquet wants to know what's the best apple tree for pies? And um, lo a question we get quite often, should I plant a second one for pollination? Well, they're all good for pie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm partial, of course, to Honeycrisp. I think it's a mm -hmm. great apple, not only for eating, but it makes a great pie, sure. too. Sure, okay. I'll, I'll share one since we can each have our opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for pies, I really like the, the firm tart late apples in Harold Red or Harold Sun. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, Honeycrisp hasn't taken over the whole world. Uh, some of these are a little more tart, give it a little firmer apple, require a little sugar that goes in the pie, but make just an exceptional pie from some of those firm tart apples. Okay. Suzanne on the North Shore says she has cilantro, which goes to seed quickly. How can I boost the garden so it doesn't seed so quickly? Now, there's a challenge. She wants to do just the opposite. She really doesn't want to boost it. Yeah. So what happens with that real rapid growth and mm. warmer temperatures, it moves right into this mature form, sets seed, and then it isn't really as, as useful as an herb. What she just wants to do is she wants to succession plant it. So every two weeks, plant a little bit more cilantro, mm. and she'll get uh, a succession of very fresh new material. Okay. Shirley on Jefferson Street has pine trees that aren't doing so well on one side after the harsh winter. I bet a lot of people are dealing with that. What What do you do about that, Tom? And and we talked about that last week a little mm -hmm. bit with seeing winter burn and, and really this is the kind of winter that you see. Most cases, we talked about it with Arborvitae last week, right. but um, it's really uh, something that most of the time the pines will grow out of. So the new growth that's going to come with should be green and fine and, and will grow out of by its, uh, on its own. So. And the fact that it's only on one side of the tree is really a primary indication that really that's, that's a winter injury yeah. effect and probably won't be a problem a month from now. Yeah. Unless we still have winter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, oh, bite your Garden tongue. Humor. Bite your Garden tongue. Humor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, one more, and it's from Karen in Lutzen. She wants to know which herbs are best to grow in the ground near the lake, or do I need to put those in a pot? Ooh, good question. I think she could grow any of them, really. Mm -hmm. She really can. There are a few, like a lot of people like to grow basil, of course, and basil is a little bit more of a warm season herb. Yeah. Many of the others, chives, uh, thyme, and so forth. The, the nice advantage being near the lake is she's probably going to be able to bring more of these through the winter. Mm -hmm. So the thyme could be established as a perennial, maybe with a little mulch. She could get some rosemary even to grow along there. So they, there are yeah. some benefits. but They all look good. They're all good yeah. in, in the warmth of the summer, but... Something like basil, sometimes that takes a little bit longer to get going. It really is a warm season crop. Yeah, and you may want, in a case like that, grow it in a container so mm -hmm. you get that additional heat like we have from uh, the, the container from Lake Superior Garden Center. So. Well, there are also herbs that you can use for remedies. They aren't just grown for their aromatics or for their flavor enhancement. Uh, but, you know, our, our first physicians were herbalists, and so these are some of the things that uh, people have carried down and, and talk about as remedies. Um, peppermint and anise for an upset stomach, herb tea with any of these herbs for a headache, for insect bites, maybe put some thyme or summer savory juice on there. And for a toothache, I read that you can chew a yarrow leaf or lemon balm. No. I'm not saying this necessarily works, <laughs> but yeah. I thought it was really interesting in researching all of the possibilities Absolutely. of things that you can use herbs yeah. for to well, help you feel better. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, is really most of the plants that have been brought 
down through time mm -hmm. really had, and, and especially even with flowers, really had a, a purpose beyond their beauty. It right. was to cure a remedy to, or to help with an illness. So mm -hmm. it was uh, to cure a remedy, to, to help with a remedy. But mm -hmm. Tom, yeah. I just don't think us horticulturists, though, are going to put the dentists out of business. <laughs> But, you Probably know, the, not. The, but the but best thing about herbs really mm -hmm. is the fact that we can improve our diets, right. and that will do more than anything to alleviate a lot of problems that people Absolutely. have. Absolutely. Well, it makes us feel better just looking at flourishing plants and flowers, and we want to show you some pictures sent to us from great gardening enthusiasts. These apple blossoms come from Grandma's tree. Mary Jane Olson of Superior says her grandmother planted two apple trees in their yard over 50 years ago, and half a century later, they not only blossom beautifully, but still produce a great baking apple. And one of Mary Jane's favorite flowers is this two-tone bearded iris. The striking stalk is planted in her garden on the Upper Peninsula at Lake Gogebic. A favorite of Lori Matson of Duluth is this pastel lavender foxglove, brimming with delicate bell-like petals. Lori also shares this up-close look at the leaves of her sedum plant, with a bit of rainwater still clinging to one sprig. Great Gardening wants to share more of the beauty of area yards and gardens, so send your photos via email to greatgardening at wdse.org or send to 632 Niagara Court, Duluth, Minnesota, and let us show what you grow. So keep those pictures coming, and thanks for sending them in. Tom, before we go, you want to mention a, a plant sale that's yeah. coming up, a very popular one. Yeah, the Duluth Garden Flower Society is having its 18th annual wow, perennial garden years. sale um, in the Rose Garden parking lot mm -hmm. on Memorial Day Saturday. It starts 8 o'clock sharp, lasts about 45 minutes, literally <laughs> so folks need to get there early for yeah. the best selection but a lot of our clubs will be there selling raising money to beautify the area okay so great that's a great way for people get a perennial garden started yeah, it really is good. it is and and please check our website for more about upcoming events and information from recent shows we have a new urban garlic bread recipe there so check that out and we want to Send out a big thank you to our phone volunteers from the Gitchigumi Club, our perennial experts, Bob Olin and Tom Casper. I have to say it, but you guys provided a lot of sage advice oh this, <laughs> this evening. Sorry, Zesty couldn't help sage. myself. And, <laughs> and thank you to all of you who called in. Thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.